Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror in detail, the realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First story. My father-in-law is in prison for trying to kill me. Now I know he was trying to be kind. One year ago, my father-in-law tried to murder me. He planned it beautifully, the trip up to the cabin in the woods that his family owned. Pushing me into the dried up old well. Pickpocket my phone. Left a gun within the well that gave me the option of killing myself instead of starving to death. His twisted version of mercy, I guess. Either way, he would have got away with it. He hadn't accounted for the lost dog, though. Hadn't thought that a couple would come looking for a beloved pet who had raced off after a deer. That they would find me, half dead from starvation and dehydration, holding the gun, contemplating it seriously after nearly three days in the well, fully aware that I was going to die of thirst before starvation. There had been no rain for days. When I woke up in hospital, my wife Samantha was by my side holding my hand, her beautiful face wet with tears. Despite my own physical pain, all I wanted to do was make her stop crying. So I softly took her hand and with great effort raised it to my lips and gave it a gentle kiss. I was so worried about you. What happened to you? She begged me, green eyes bright with tears. The nurse came in and took my vitals, then told my wife that she should leave me to sleep some more. I was glad for the rescue because I knew once I revealed what had really happened to me, my wife's heart would break permanently. Her father had always been her favorite person. I met Samantha at work three years ago. She was the marketing executive where I was a software developer. We were both in our late 20s and I knew within 10 minutes of our first conversation that I was going to marry her. She was bright, funny, clever, and it didn't hurt that she was absolutely gorgeous with bright green eyes and long red hair. For months into dating her, she met my family. I come from a massive family where both my parents had four siblings each and then went on to have five kids together too. Our Sunday lunches are loud, raucous events at my folks' place with at least 20 people in attendance, but Sam was utterly charmed by my family. And my parents and siblings adored her. She fit right in like the missing piece of a jigsaw puzzle. Everything was going so well until Sam decided it was time for me to meet her only family member, her father. Cameron Joyce was a tall, burly man who dressed and looked like a lumberjack. He lived in a neighborhood at the very edge of the suburbs, close to a big, wide forest. When he stiffly shook my hand, his blue eyes ice cold, a sort of chill ran through me. After we walked into the two-bedroom house behind him, the first red flag should have been that there were no photos of Sam's mother. Not one. In fact, if I truly thought about it, Sam never really spoke about her mother. I should have asked more questions about her, but I guess I always just assumed that the subject was too painful for her. The first time I thought her father was trying to kill me was a fleeting thought which happened to visit. I distinctly heard Sam tell her father over the phone multiple times that I had a nut allergy, but when we sat down to eat, I started to feel my throat swell up. Sam's father watched me cough, slowly chewing his food. Of course we had an EpiPen on us, but if we hadn't, I could be dead right now. Then it was the time right after our wedding when he knew I couldn't swim, but I am 90% sure he pushed me into the lake when the three of us were on the docks looking at his boat. The third time was the charm, though. If those hikers hadn't found me, I'm sure I would have died down in that well. You might be wondering why I chose to go to that cabin with a man I thought was trying to kill me. Because I really didn't think he was trying to kill me. My brain insisted that I had misread or misheard the situation and both those incidents could have been accidents. Also, Sam was keen her father and her husband. And I just couldn't break her heart. I'll never forget the ride to go the cabin. My father-in-law was a man of few words. So when he decided to tell me a story, I almost sighed with relief that I didn't have to keep talking to fill the dead air between us. He kept his eyes on the road and said, there was once a boy who lived a happy life with his family in the forest. It was him, his three brothers, his parents, his grandparents, 
his uncles and aunts and all his cousins. He didn't know much about the world beyond his family home, but he had a thousand things to do in the woods so he never wondered. For a time, all was well and as it should be. The boy and his family lived off the land, hunted, and thrived. Until one day on his 19th birthday, the boy saw the woman in white in the gut of the trees. Ethereal and shimmering, she glowed like a white will-o'-the-wisp. When he asked his mother about her, she told him to stay away from the woman. That nothing good comes out of the woods on a sickle moon night. We were close to the cabin now, and as we approached it, a strange sort of feeling was beginning to crawl up my spine. A sense of something being wrong gripping me tightly. The boy listened to his mother. Two days he did not go looking for the woman. On the third night, he found himself outside the house walking into the woods. As he drew closer, he saw the woman's face. Her gold hair shimmered all the way to her knees. Ice blue eyes and a lovely face that glowed with the promise of a forever his mortal brain didn't understand. The woman offered him her hand. Entranced, he reached out and took it. He parked and turned off the engine of the car but still wouldn't look at me instead. He stared ahead into the depth of the forest as he told me this eerie tale. The minute he took that hand, the thing claimed him. They found him a year later at the top of a mountain living in a cave, naked and insane, speaking a strange tongue in a language which had to be made up. What was terrifying was that both his legs from his knees downwards were gone. And yet, the wounds had been cauterized and someone or something had clearly been feeding him. His parents brought him home and tried to help him recover his mind. The doctors fitted him with prosthetic legs he kept hidden away. But the boy was never really the same again. When he began to slowly speak again, he spoke of a woman with a skull instead of a face, a long, skeletal crone's body, fangs instead of teeth, clumps of white hair that fell out of her head and milk-white eyes, the eyes of a corpse. And then, finally, the ear-piercing scream. He fell silent then, in my skin crawling, I asked him, what happened to him? My father-in-law broke out of his trance and looked at me, his expression unreadable. Let me show you how to hunt. The trial was short. My father-in-law was caught in possession of my phone and several other items that suggested what he planned to do. His internet search history revealed extensive ways to murder someone. When they put Cameron Joyce in prison, my wife cried herself to sleep every night for a month. I think she blamed me for what happened even though she would never say those words. I would catch her looking out from our apartment in the direction of the forest which we could see clearly. She grew more and more forgetful, wouldn't go to work, would sleep all day. Some days she wouldn't even brush her hair. Her face grew more haggard and sometimes when I saw her naked form in bed in the moonlight, I could swear I saw her ribs through her translucent skin. Her sadness was going to devour her. And there was nothing I could do about it. One day I came home and she wasn't there. I looked for her everywhere. I don't know how I knew it, but somehow I knew she would be at the cabin. I jumped into my car and sped there at full speed, not caring how many fines I would have to pay. I got there just before dark and I caught sight of her. She was naked, her back to me facing the forest. Sam. I called her name as I got out of the car. She didn't turn to look at me. Instead she stood there, her messy red hair lifted by the breeze. I called to her again, a deep sense of unease in my bones. Sam. Slowly, she turned to face me. And that was when I saw her face. A skull. A distended jaw that opened much, much too wide. That was when she let out an ear-piercing scream. A sharp pain burst through my head and I immediately clapped my hands over my ears. I tried screaming my wife's name again, but all I could hear was the shriek that was starting to feel like someone was knifing my brain. My vision swam and I stumbled backward. A dozen figures had appeared from the woods. All of them with skull-like faces, impossibly distended jaws, and the same milk-white eyes that had replaced my wife's bright green ones. And they were all walking towards me. I didn't even think. I got into my car and started the engine, my ears bleeding from the sound of the scream. I ran. Two days later I am couched surfing at a friend's after the doctors had dealt with one perforated eardrum. 
They told me I was lucky both my eardrums hadn't burst from the volume I was listening to music at. I had just nodded and let them get on with it. There was a ringing in my ears I couldn't quite get rid of no matter how I tried. There was no way I could explain what had happened in those woods to them. I am waiting for the ringing and the headache to stop before I go looking for Sam again. This time I will take a gun. I'll find her and bring her home. I've already spoken to the police, but I know they just aren't as motivated to find her as me. My phone rings and I gingerly held it to my good ear. It's a collect call from the prison. I accept it because who else could possibly give me answers? It happened, didn't it? My father-in-law's gruff voice made me nearly drop the phone. I swallowed hard. Sam's gone. I said numbly. She's gone back where she belongs. He said. You're lucky. How am I lucky? I asked. Bitter anger surging through me, she was my wife and your daughter. That thing was no daughter nor a wife. It knows how to mimic being human. Why do you think I told you that story? His voice was low and even. My jaw dropped. Was he really suggesting he was the boy from the dark fairy tale he is told? You're cruel. Disowning your daughter, trying to kill me. You should dash. Listen to me, boy, and listen good. That creature was dropped at my doorstep a few months after I came home from the forest. It was an infant then, and it butchered my parents. I found pieces of them around their cabin for years. It then proceeded to kill everyone related to me. But it wouldn't let me die or kill me, and I couldn't figure out why until I realized it needed me the way a parasite needs its host. Finally, when everyone I loved was dead and buried, it needed more prey. And it found you. It will take pieces of you, then keep you alive to take pieces of everyone you love. It will feed on your pain as you live through your own horror show. I swallowed hard. He had lost his damned mind, surely. What on earth was he trying to say? If I were you, I would take all my belongings and leave. Leave the state. Hell, leave the country. Don't ever look back. You hear me? Ever. With a sharp click, he hung up. I wish I had listened to him. I wish I hadn't decided that I needed to rescue my wife at any cost. Instead, I am sitting here in the dark inside the old cabin looking outside the window. My fingers folded around the hunting rifle. A sickle moon gleams silver, the only light in the jet black night. And there inside the darkness, I think I see a figure shimmer. From a distance, she almost looks like my wife. Almost. Until her inhuman skeletal jaw distends. And she screams. Second story. If you see something waving at you from the woods, don't wave back. I've always loved the snowy plains of my home area. It's so different here. There's a sense of vastness to it. Each year my brother Marcus and I take the long trip back. It's become a sort of tradition to us. We go on a long hike to the cabin and spend the weekend there. We usually reminisce about childhood and play our old board games. When Marcus asked me if he could bring his girlfriend Melanie along, it took me a while before I obliged. Melanie had been enthusiastic at the outset. After an hour on the long hiking track, that had all changed. Ugh, couldn't we just drive there? And miss all that? I said spreading my arms in a wide arc. It's just snow, Steve. I don't get what the big deal is. Come on, babe, Marcus interjected, putting his arms around her. Isn't the view nice? I guess so, I'm just so tired of walking. I couldn't help but laugh to myself. I'd warned her that it was a long trip to the cabin, but of course... She hadn't listened. We can take a break once we reach the resting area, okay? I tried comforting her. And how long is that? About another half hour or so. As she sighed behind me, I heard Marcus laugh. While the two of them were teasing each other, I went ahead a bit and let my eyes wander over the white plans around us. It was so beautiful and quiet. How often had we played out here as kids I wondered for a moment. Hey, what's that over there? I heard Melanie ask from behind. I turned back to find her and Marcus looking over at a forest at least half a kilometer away from us. What do you mean? I asked. There's someone over there. I couldn't make out much, and it took me a while before I saw who she was referring to. There was a person at the edge of the forest. 
Must be another hiker or one of the forest workers. Look, he's waving at us, she exclaimed before she raised her own arm to return the greeting. Hello over there. I doubt he can hear you, Marcus said. It doesn't matter. I'm just nice. For a while, the figure continued to wave, and Melanie waved back a few more times. After a while, whoever it was seemed to be satisfied and vanished between the trees again. We continued on, and about ten minutes later Marcus walked up to me. So did you read it yet? Eh, what do you mean? He rolled his eyes at me. You know what I'm talking about, Dad's novel. Well, I started it, but I haven't gotten far yet, I admitted. Come on, Steve, he worked so hard on it. The least you can do is read it, okay? Guys, I think he's following us. Who is? A Marcus ass turning around. That guy from before. I just saw him over there. With that she pointed to a stretch of forest to our left. You sure it's the same guy? It could be just another dash. Yes. It looked exactly the same, and he was waving towards me again. Well, that's what you get for waving at strangers. That's not funny, Marcus. Seriously, what if it's... I don't know, some psycho or something? Both Marcus and I started laughing. It's probably another hiker, Marcus said trying to calm her down. Yeah, or it's someone from the village who thinks it's funny to fuck with people, I continued. God knows Martin would do this exact thing, right? He so would, Marcus agreed. What? Who's Martin? Melanie asked, staring at us. Just a friend from our childhood. One of the weirdest guys we ever knew. As we continued on, Marcus and I started to tell Melanie a bit more about our adventures with our friend Martin. Soon enough, we'd all forgotten the mysterious person who'd been waving towards us and were laughing and joking around again. I just started another tale when we reached the small resting area. It wasn't much, nothing more than a bench under a wooden overhang. By now, we could already see the small, forestry hill on which the cabin was located. My legs are killing me, Melanie complained as she slumped down on the bench next to me. Well, we're still only halfway there, I joked. She gave me a you-can't-be-for-real face. When I saw it, I burst out laughing. It's only about 20 more minutes, we're almost there. Fuck you, Steve. She yelled at me and started to hit my shoulder before she started laughing as well. I totally believed you, idiot, she yelled. Suddenly, she jumped up from the bench. Oh my god, guys, look, dear. With that, she rushed back to the path, took out her phone, and started taking pictures. So much about her legs, Marcus whispered. She's a nice girl, I finally said smiling at him. Yeah, I'm glad I met her. I asked him how exactly the two of them had met. Marcus had barely started the story when Melanie came running back towards us. He's back again. This time we didn't need to ask who she met. He was over there, ahead of us, near this old ruin or what it is. Marcus was by her side in a moment. Are you serious? Over there? I stepped towards them and looked ahead. On the foot of the small hill there were the remains of an old building. That's where she'd seen him? Come on, it's probably nothing. Maybe he saw us resting here and decided to give us a last greeting. Maybe he thinks we're from the village, too. I don't care. It's creepy. That's what it is. If he comes near you, I'll beat the shit out of him. Marcus promised her in a serious voice. Come on, let's get going. No reason to wait here and argue about it. Whoever it is might be long gone anyways. Melanie said nothing. Only once we'd gotten closer to the old ruin I heard her again. Her voice was quiet, almost a whisper. It can't be. There's no way. When I turned towards her, I saw she'd stopped in her tracks. Her face was a mask of disbelief. Babe, what is it? How can he be this tall? She almost screamed, pointing at the walls that remained of the ruin. He was way taller than these. I thought the walls were only a meter or so tall, but, but. She broke up. I looked at the old ruin. The two walls that were still standing were almost three meters tall. You probably saw it wrong. We were so far away, so dash. I know what I saw, Marcus. He was standing right here. I couldn't help but wonder what she'd seen. 
It had to be an optical illusion or something. What else could it be? Still, I started to feel a bit unsettled about the whole thing myself. Let's go to the cabin. If there is someone following us, we'll be safe there. For a moment Melanie wanted to say something, but then she merely nodded. It wasn't much longer before we arrived at the cabin. I saw that Melanie's eyes were still daring around, scanning the trees, searching for some giant figure. Two twists of the key, and the door sprang open. The place was exactly the same as Marcus and I had left it a year ago. It shouldn't take long before the place warms up, I said as I stepped to the fireplace. While I was busy to use what few logs were inside to start a fire, I heard Marcus speak to Melanie in a low voice. I saw her nodding a few times before she began to sort through her things. As I heated up some coffee, Marcus went upstairs to look for our games. When I brought Melanie a cup of coffee, I found her on the phone, browsing through Facebook. Really? I asked her. She looked up at me for a moment before she put her phone away. Fine. I put it away, there's no internet out here anyway. For a moment she pouted, but then she started laughing and took the cup of coffee from my hands. A few minutes later Marcus came back with the huge box that held our old games. Most of it was the simple board games we'd played as kids, like Monopoly. There was one other game though, the one we created ourselves. It was a sort of Dungeons and Dragons board game. It was nothing fancy. You just moved over a board, battled monsters, and who defeated the final boss first one. Still, even as adults, the two of us loved playing this silly thing. Even Melanie was eager to join in. It wasn't the game itself that was interesting, it was the stories we had about it. After the first round was over, I decided to go outside and get a bit more firewood. There had only been a few logs left next to the fireplace, so if we wanted to keep the fire going, I had to get a few more. I put on my thick winter cloth and boots and went outside. It had gotten dark outside by now. During the day the area was a beautiful winter wonderland. At night, it was nothing short of creepy. I pushed the thought that we were completely alone out here as far to the back of my mind as I could. With quick steps, I hurried to the stack of firewood next to the cabin and started to pick up log after log. I couldn't help but look around every once in a while and listen to the sounds of the night. There was a slight breeze that gently shook the trees back and forth. Just as I picked up the last of about a dozen logs, I heard a crunching sound nearby. It sounded almost as if someone was walking through the snow. I jerked around and looked, but no one was there. It was most likely an animal. Or hell, maybe some snow had fallen off a branch nearby. I walked back toward the front door. I was halfway there when I heard it again. As I turned around this time, I could have sworn I saw a shadow between the trees. I felt the hair of the back of my neck stand up. For long seconds I watched the trees to the left of the cabin. Need any help? Marcus suddenly called out to me. I almost jumped up, and half the logs tumbled off my arms. Jesus Christ! Don't do that! I yelled. Marcus started laughing and walked over to pick up the ones I dropped. You're always so scared in the dark, it's hilarious. I was about to tell him what I thought I'd seen when I noticed Melanie at the door behind him. I shook my head and decided to drop the target. It must have been my imagination or the light from the house playing a trick on me. I warmed up some mulled wine, Melanie said as we stacked the logs next to the fireplace. Great, thank you. I said as I took off my boots and rubbed my hands against each other. The mulled wine was almost too hot to drink, yet I took a big sip. It warmed me up in an instant. I'd always loved the stuff. For a while we sat together, talking and joking before Melanie said she was getting a bit sleepy. Guess it was all that walking today. Come on, I'll show you our room. With that Marcus led her upstairs. While the two of them went up, I walked back to the small stove. I heated up a bit more of the mulled wine and refilled my cup. Suddenly, I heard a noise again. It was muffled, but it sounded almost as if something was scratching against the side of the cabin. Must be the branches of the trees, I thought. As I stood at the stove with my cup, I started to wonder. Wasn't there only a slight breeze? This was a bit too loud, wasn't it? 
I felt the same sense of dread wash over me once more. What if there was someone out there? I hope you heated up some for me as well. Marcus called out to me from the stairs. Not going to join her in bed? I asked, grinning at him. Nah, maybe later, he answered. There's something I want to talk to you about. Something important. I know, I know. I really should read Dad's book. It's just Dash. No, it's not about that. It's about the cabin. Dad wants to sell it since no one is using it anymore except for us. Wait, what? This place is our cabin. We've spent so many winters here, and he wants to sell it like this. Well, we're only ever here once a year, so I get where he's coming from. That's not the point. I almost yelled at him. What about all our memories? Hey, calm down, Marcus said raising his hands, but Dad's got A. He trailed off, and I saw him look around. I'd heard it too. The sound was back again, this time it was louder. It was almost as if something or someone was scratching along the wood outside. What the hell's that? There it was once more. I'm going to have a look, I said. Marcus was right by my side, putting on his shoes as well. You're not going out there alone. I nodded and picked up the old iron fire poker. Then we tiptoed to the front door. A quick look out the window showed us nothing but the dark of the night and trees slowly shaking in the wind. Shit, I cursed. A moment later we stepped outside. Had that guy been stalking us and sneaking up on us in the middle of the night? Fucking hell. This was seriously creepy. I raised the fire poker, ready to beat down on any deranged asshole trying to jump me. I'd barely taken a few steps when I saw something move near the corner of the cabin. It was gone as quickly as I'd seen it, but I knew someone was there. Shit, that's right below her window, Marcus whispered. Go and get her. If it's really that guy again. For a moment he hesitated, then he nodded and went back inside. Who's there? I called out. What the hell are you doing here? No answer. There it was once more, the crunching of snow, the scratching on the wood. My hands were shaking as they clutched onto the fire poker. I jumped around the corner, ready to yell, only to stop dead in my track. There was something there. It was no man, though, and neither was it an animal. It was a giant, hulking figure, leaning forward against the house. It must have been at least four, if not five meters tall. I saw long, claw-like fingers. They were almost digging into the woodwork as the thing pressed its face against the window. I stood there, staring up at the impossibility in front of me. What in the... was all I could bring out. Right at that moment the thing's head jerked in my direction. Its face was simple, too simple. It looked almost as if someone had sewn a face on a piece of cloth or a bag. The lower part ripped open, and the creature let out a high-pitched scream. It raised its arms before it brought them crashing down against the woodwork and the window. Wooden glass exploded under the force. I heard chaos erupt inside of the room above. I heard Marcus and Melanie scream up in terror. In a second the thing's arms vanished inside the gaping hole that had once been a window. I heard Marcus yell something before his screams cut through the night. They continued only for moments and culminated in terrible blood-curling wail. Then everything was quiet again. I couldn't do a thing. I was frozen in terror. I took a single step forward, but then cringed back. The fire poker slipped from my hands as I slumped down in the snow. For a moment the thing looked over at me. It didn't seem malignant anymore. It looked almost... happy. Finally, it turned from me towards the trees. Within seconds it had vanished again. Before it was gone though, I'd seen that it had been holding something in his giant hands. It had been Melanie's limp body. Third story. There's a hatch in the middle of the woods. It was old. Older than God. Older than the hundred-foot pines that towered above. It looked like a submarine hatch, sitting on a low concrete rise planted firmly in the forest floor. It wore a tight beard of pine needles over a rusted wheel handle with bolts the size of apples. It took both of us to get the handle to turn. Metal groaned in protest, screamed as it shaved away the layer of rust that had welded it shut. Together we pulled the lid open. It was heavy, heavier than a house. Then it split back on its hinge with a sigh of stale air. 
Darkness seemed to spill out of the hatchway, like it had been bottled up for eons and was now ready to infect the world. It looked as though a great metal mouth had opened up in the forest floor. A predator's mouth, starving and ready to feed. We peered down. A service ladder of rebar-like rungs descended the dark concrete bore into the great unknown. Hazy overcast sunlight fought the darkness and lost, penetrating a meager five feet before shadow claimed the hole for its own. Sammy found a rock that looked like a cat's head, negotiated it over the hatch and dropped it down. It whistled off into darkness. We waited, two teenage girls in the woods of Washington, listening for a sound that never came, that rock hitting the bottom. I was spending a month of summer with my cousin Sammy at our grandma's place up in northern Washington. It was a gray and sunny July. I'd only been there a day, but a kingdom of storm clouds had rolled in off the ocean and pitched camp over our corner of Washington, issuing unto it low, endless drizzle that left the world soggy and awful. Today, however, the clouds had parted, peeling back in a blast of sunlight, and leaving Sammy and I to our daily dose of mischief, two purloined cigarettes. With the smokes in hand, we cut out through the trees behind Grandma's house in search of someplace suitably grunge to light up. We followed a thin vein of hiking trail, eventually breaking off on our own through the wide, primordial riot of woods, not entirely claustrophobic, but dense enough that the massive pines would be warring for root space. We had been off the trail for no more than ten minutes when Sammy called out to me, indicating the closed hatch that would eventually swallow us whole. We brushed away a thin skeleton of branches, a great bed of moss, a tangle of brush to finally unearth the thing that resembled something city workers in bright orange vests might descend to access a gas main. Which was odd because it bore no markings to denote its origin. Not even warnings with penal codes to dissuade would-be vandals. It was anonymous and disconcerting, like its lack of designation meant it didn't belong, like it was an interloper. Sammy had asked me something. I looked up at her. What? What is it? She repeated, curious gaze pinned on the hatch. I don't know, I told her. I don't know what it is. I knew it was old. Older than God. Older than the hundred-foot pines that towered above. The hatch was open and Sammy wanted to go down. Come on, Laney, she groaned. It'll be fun. We'll poke around, take some shots for our feeds. I'm not on that shit, I shot back. Social media is the death of rational thought. True, she grumbled. But what are we supposed to do? Hang out with Grandma all day and watch Rebel Without a Cause with commercials? I took a long, pensive drag on the stale Winston, not wanting to admit that I was kind of terrified. Not only was I worried about the hatch lid slamming on us, trapping us in, but the thought of climbing down that shadowy ladder, of disappearing into the earth's dark, quiet belly, made me want to vomit. Luckily, I didn't have to make any excuses. It started to rain. Shit, Sammy hissed as the first spray of drizzle fell in gray sheets. Help me close it. Don't want it to flood. The rain was a fine mist, nothing more than a sneeze, and I doubted very much if it would flood, but I was more than happy to help her seal off that dark orifice. We did, together, before heading back through the trees, leaving the hatch behind. We were soaked through by the time we made it back to Grandma's. She fixed us plates of hot lasagna, and we all watched James Dean's effortless cool and rebel. With the commercials. My grandma's house was not unimpressive. It was a two-story Victorian rising in a collage of faded red and white from a wide lot of crabgrass, the open property hemmed by a wrought iron fence, all of it seemingly weighed down by a hundred years of history. It looked like something out of a Tim Burton movie, a gothic manor surrounded by woods. A lone raft stranded in a sea of trees. I was staying in my dad's old digs, a mess of ancient band posters and records. Breezy punk stuff like the Gun Club and the Wipers. Despite all the vinyl, I was plugged into Spotify and Bowie was wailing Moonage Daydream when Sammy slipped in, face bright with mischief. Come on, she said in an excited, breathy whisper. Let's go. It was late. Dark and late. I thought she had gone to bed. 
but she claimed a spot on the edge of my bed, charged with nervous energy. I lost my headphones and shifted to look at her, her eyes wide and excited. What? Go. I screwed my face into a confused knot. The thing. The hole in the ground. The mention of the hatch, the mouth, made my skin crawl. What? I said. No way. It's like midnight. It's atmospheric, she countered. It's pitch dark out. So? We'll vlog it or something. Record it. I dunno, it'll be fun. I groaned, shook my head. No fucking way. Then I'll go without you, Sammy Hoft. Into the hole? In the middle of the night? Yup. Totally alone. So if I get molested by subwelling mutates, it's on you. Cost you the older cousin and all. Don't be a bitch, I said, feeling my cheeks flare up. She smiled, a dimple forming beside her mouth, clearly amused at having manipulated me into a stalemate of mutually assured destruction. I was caught. Either I go with her and keep her in check, or I let her go alone and something might happen. She was fifteen, only a year younger than me, but impulsive and brash, and it wouldn't surprise me if she got hurt. I could claim ignorance, but if something happened I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Despite being just cousins, we had always been close, always been more like sisters than anything else. Sammy could drive me up the wall, but I still loved her, and I could see in her eyes that she wouldn't be swayed. I blew another long sigh, pushed myself off the bed, shrugged on my black windbreaker. Let's get some fucking flashlights, I said. I prayed for rain I knew wouldn't come. The clouds had burned off in the moonlight, leaving the heavens bright and clear. We had found a set of headlamps in Grandma's junk drawer and navigated the low woods by the watery beams they provided. I had also taken an old Swiss army knife. It was made of rust and looked like it had survived the Great War, but I took it just in case. I was hoping I wouldn't need it, hoping we wouldn't find the hatch, hoping it would be lost in the riot of trees. But something deep down, a high tickle in the deepest wrinkles of my soul, told me we would find it. And we did. Almost immediately. It resolved out of the darkness, a small brutalist platform rising out of the still damp soil. Had it been so close before? It must have been. Must have. Sammy was recording us with her phone, posting them on Instagram or something. Who knows? My vision had whittled down to a dizzying pinprick and all I could hear was the hot rush of blood pounding through my ears. I helped her tug open the hatch, vaguely heard myself ask if she really wanted to do this. Of course I do, she said with a tight smile as she pocketed her phone. It'll be exciting. Then she mounted the ladder and started off down the hatch. That sound only could have been made by the hatch lid slamming shut. We had been climbing down the narrow bore for five minutes, each rung burning with a hot metal freeze that nibbled through flesh and seemed to lick at the bone, when there had been a loud, metallic report. Thunk. We both froze on the ladder, Sammy just below me, panting like a tired dog. What was that? I whispered, hauling stale air through my aching lungs. Why are Sammy started in her normal voice, before dropping it an octave? Why are you whispering? What was that? I asked again. But I didn't have to ask. I already knew. She did, too. I heard the growing scuffle of her climbing back up the ladder. I started, too. One white hot rung after the next, my palms burning, my heart beating its angry fist against my ribs. The climb up was hard. My body seemed to weigh too much. Like each limb was encased in lead as I pulled myself up, up, nearing what I knew I'd find. And I was right. The hatch was closed. I pounded on it. Screamed. Knowing that the only ones to hear would be us. I chipped away at it with the army knife to no avail. We tried our phones, first mine then Sammy's, pressing the devices to the lid's rough, rusted skin. No reception. Nothing but. The mouth. No one but us, two teenage girls, her with red hair, me with brown, trapped in an awful ladder with nowhere to go but down. I don't like this, Sammy croaked. She sounded so young, like a little girl clutching her teddy bear after an especially dreadful nightmare. I didn't like it either. It was wrong. 
It was so, so wrong. It was. It was a pyramid of rocks. The climb down the ladder had been impossible. Time fell away, shifting into a dull blur that didn't much matter. All that mattered was finding your footing as you lowered yourself down, down, rung after rung, step after step. It might have been an hour or ten, but a while later, a long, long while, we hit a wide concrete room. It was about the size of your average backyard. The ceiling low, unblemished spare the circular opening through which the ladder ran. Shadows shifted and danced in black relief as we played our headlights across the dark space. On the wall opposite the ladder stood a wide, ruined opening. Nothing but darkness beyond it. The massive bank vault-style door that had once filled it sat in a twisted, broken heap nearby, torn free of its hinges by something that was disturbing. It sent a sudden flood of hot dread filling my guts like boiling water. But what was worse was the pyramid. It stood in the center of the room like a shitty roadside art sculpture, a painstaking pyramid fashioned out of countless rocks. I knew where those stones had come from. Sammy did too. They had been dropped from the above by people like us. Hundreds of them, thousands, sacrificed to the darkness of the earth. The mouth. I knew because topping the pyramid like a Christmas tree star was the rock Sammy had dropped earlier. The exact same one, no doubt about it, tucked carefully atop the mountain of stones. Placed there by someone. Something. A high trembling sound like an animal in a snare filled the room, as the reality of the situation hit Sammy, she had started to cry. She was losing it, unraveling at the seams. Sitting on the floor, knees to her chest, rocking and sobbing and apologizing for bringing me down here. We had to move. My whole body was one big screaming ache, and if we let exhaustion ease its warm blanket over our shoulders, we'd never get going. I sought air through my lungs and boiled it into authority. We have to go, I said. She sniffled. What? Her voice was nasally. She raised a trembling finger to the cracked entryway across the room. Through? There. I nodded. Struck one of the matches I still had from the cigarettes. The flame wavered, guttered as a breeze tugged at it. There's a breeze, I said. Airflow. Another way out. She sniffled, shook her head. No. No way. I say we wait here, wait for someone to open the hatch. No one knows we're down here, I reminded her. No one. But what if? She started, looking at the pyramid of rocks. She lowered her voice, a hoarse whisper. What if the thing that made that is in, there? Where else would it be? I thought. But I didn't say that she was close to catatonia, and I needed her in motion. We have nowhere else to go, I said. Nowhere. She looked at me, her face pale and ghostly in the light of my headlamp. Her eyes were puffy, red, bright with terror. Then she summoned her courage like one would a lungful of air, and nodded. I hauled her to her feet, and we started off through the doorway. There's someone following us, Sammy said in a choked whisper. The entryway had fed us into an underground hospital. It was abandoned, left to rot beneath the earth. A maze of scarred linoleum hallways, moldering gurneys with thick leather straps, blown out doorways with padded rooms beyond. No, not a hospital, an asylum, or a laboratory, a kind of psycho mixture of both. Its construction spoke of a time before technology and the advancement of human rights. Yellowed walls and popcorn ceilings were shredded, torn to ribbons, like a feral something had been set loose. Rusty smears of dried blood textured the white darkness here and there. It was awful. Each footfall, each pull of breath, all sounds seemed to echo, clang, reverberate through the white walls of this underground labyrinth. It was like a nightmarish Escher painting. It was. The mouth. Up until then we had been negotiating slowly, rounding corners, finding more shadow-soaked hallways, passing an overturned reception desk, more padded cells, driven forth by terror and primal survival instinct. Then Sammy had whispered in my ear, her breath hot, her voice hoarse with terror. There's someone following us. I froze. A cold infection of goosebumps went sprouting up over my body. 
My lungs were tight, empty of air. My heart was pounding with icy fear. I turned, slowly, not wanting to make a sound, afraid that if I did it might make this someone real. She must have imagined it. There was no one. There was. Then I saw the eyes. Two dull, milky pinpricks hovering just outside the light of our headlamps. They were head level, higher than head level. Unblinking, hovering and watching. Eyes. Sammy's body was right up against mine. She was wound up like an overtort screw. Terror radiated from her in hot waves. I could feel fear beating through her veins. Ka-thump, ka-thump, ka-thump. The eyes moved so suddenly that both of us screamed. They surged forward without any warning, rushed at us. The thing, the something, the awful subdwelling mutate that would devour our hot intestines while we were still shrieking. I saw its crooked, emaciated silhouette lumbering and lurching toward us. A tall broken thing, its arms stick-like and so impossibly thin. Those glowing blind eyes set into a narrow, malformed head, as molded and precise as a canine skull. Then the creature hit our pool of light and the eyeballs popped out of thin air, like the light had banished that thing, leaving only two marbles which clattered down, hit the floor, bounced, and rolled to our feet. They stared up at us, pale, seeing, and somehow blasphemous. Sammy and I jerked back and bolted like the wind. My cousin screamed and yanked me back just as solid ground dropped out beneath me. We had been in a blind rush, a blur of hallways scrolling by, passing padded cells with shadows that moved within them. When the floor had suddenly stopped being, Sammy grabbed my shirt and jerked me back just as I went tumbling out over the sudden chasm. After a gut-wrenching second of uncertainty, I found myself on solid ground, looking down at the vast, empty nothingness. There was a 20-foot canyon separating this side from the other, a thin, splintery plank board running across it. It looked like someone had shoveled out a massive, crude pit in the hallway of the underground nightmare. We peered down, hauling air through broken lungs, hearts pounding, not sure what we were seeing. A solid knot of arms and legs, interwoven and laced together, filled out the bottom of the abyss. They were gray, broken, decayed, Torn flesh hung from bone, massive boils filled with hot pus textured rotting skin. But this wasn't a shallow grave, and they weren't the departed. As soon as our light hit them they slithered apart, breaking away like a hive of snakes under the burning heat of a magnifying glass. Dreadful heads, pained and drawn in agony, recoiled from the light, broken, human-like things forcing themselves off into shadow to reclaim what little salvation they had. They hissed and moaned and chuckled with insane humor, like condemned souls cast from heaven, forever banished to this pit of darkness for an existence of raw pain. Oh my God, Sammy croaked. Oh my God. But there was no God in this place. It was a great blasphemy born from the sin of the unrighteous. It was awesome and awful. It was. A low sound came from behind us, tucked into the cacophony of torment. Sammy didn't hear it, too taken with the pit of the damned. I slowly turned, turned, my heart fluttering with icy dread, my stomach nodding in on itself. But the hallway behind us was empty. I blew a relieved sigh. The giant meat spider exploded out of the darkness with a throaty screech, a blur of limbs carrying it across the scuffed ceiling. But they weren't limbs, they were human arms and legs. I gasped as it rattled down the wall hissing and pulsing with hideous life as it joined the floor and surged forward. It bubbled into the light. A nightmarish set of conjoined twins, two separate androgynous entities melded together, appendages beginning where others ended, scraps of face in all the wrong places. Eyeballs and noses and mouths all scattered about its lumpy, fleshy form. It was a nightmare of terrible industry. And its head much like a spider's, was bulbous and truly heinous. Patches of hair textured its lumpy scalp above rows of eyeballs and a wide mouth of thick razor teeth. Sammy turned, screamed, and stepped back. It was instinctive, a single misplaced move that sent her out over empty space. 
She reached out for me, her fingertips skimming my arm as she issued a surprised O. Then she was gone, plummeting into the sea of souls, swallowed by the mass of forgotten bodies. I heard her shriek. Heard her wail in bright agony as those things tore her limb for limb, picking her apart like a mean kid with a stunt fly. Then I looked up and a fleshy mass of teeth and eyes and hatred was atop me. The meat spider tore me down into darkness. I awoke in a biblical spider web to the reek of death. It was a dark, sticky place, hot with the stench of dead things. The smell flooded my lungs, burned my nose and eyes. I looked around, my eyes adjusting to the gloomy haze. I'd lost my headlamp. Fibrous white nets resolved out of the darkness, stretching to and fro like an entropic masterpiece, all of it seemingly random and oddly beautiful in its precision. An incredible tapestry of psycho nature. Massive cocoon lumps textured the space, scattered throughout the nest like sleeping beauties. They were prey. And so was I. I couldn't move. I was melted to a wall of webbing by a spray of fiber, not entirely cocooned, but imprisoned in a straitjacket of dreadful string. I tried to scream, but my mouth was gagged with a shred of webbing. I issued a low, muffled shriek. The sound of despair. Then the entire formation began to tremble with a low vibration. I heard a tight hiss, saw a dark shape skitter by. The meat spider mounted the nearest cocoon and tore into it with its terrible human-like arms, craning its lumpy head to suck meat from bone. I heard congested slurping, things tearing, flesh and bone snapping apart. It was feeding, and it would come for me next. I slowly began to struggle, trying to work some slack into my binds. But they held firm. Held. Firm. I felt something firm in my back pocket. I patted it desperately. The Swiss army knife. I worked it out, popped the blade as the noise of feeding slowed, as the awful meat spider shredded its fill from one of its victims. I eased the rusty blade through the webbing and began to saw. It was like cutting through canvas. The web behind me instantly began to slacken, splitting apart, losing its tension as. Oh God. Oh no. The meat spider lunged, drenched in still hot blood, moving with that deliberate speed afforded only to creepy crawlies. It was coming for me, arms and legs pumping, its misshapen form throbbing with terrible heat. I worked the Swiss army knife harder, faster, hacking away blindly, hatcheting apart the web holding me captive. And I could smell it, oh God, the reek of ancient rot, of things dead and decayed and hate, and it was here, oh God it was here. The meat spider lunged. For a terrifying instant all I saw were eyes and teeth. There was a horrible intelligence in those eyes, an awful cunning that reminded me so much of the dead-eyed stare of serial killers in court. Then the web split beneath me and I fell. A second later and I would have been girl meat. Instead I was tumbling down, down, plummeting like a stone, the ground black and solid and rushing toward me. It slammed into me like a freight train and I crumpled like a bird. It wasn't solid ground, it was an angry rush of water. A river tumbled and heaved through a rocky canyon. The rapids frothed like a rabid dog, whipping me around like a rag doll in the hands of a brat. I snapped this way and that, barking my arms and legs and brain off lips of rock that seemed to bite out at me. Water that reeked of rotten gasoline and the thousands of dead things it had washed away flooded my mouth, filled my lungs. I choked and fought and tumbled downstream until blackness expanded. I awoke in a drain pipe to the first light of dawn. It painted strange shapes on the curved concrete bore in which I was delivered. I folded over and vomited a warm spray of water. A thin trickle ran from the darkness of the pipe, issuing through my hands, hair, flushing me with sobriety. That darkness repulsed me, made my skin ache and crawl with nausea. I staggered toward the light, fought my way out into a rocky shore. Seagulls were honking angrily, fighting over a scrap of meat on the beach. Other seabirds twisted through the foggy air above gray waters. The ocean heaved at my feet. I looked up at the sky and cried. A trucker found me limping along the highway like an abused dog. I didn't struggle when he dragged me to the car. 
I collapsed limply into his arms and let myself be taken. He rushed me to the nearest hospital. I found out I was 80 miles from Grandma's. I'm in a sterile white place now, a hospital that reminds me so much of that underground nightmare of things that should never see the light of day. I started this account hoping it would bring me peace, hoping it would help me come to terms with the trauma I'd faced. It hasn't helped at all. The police are still looking for the hatch and for Sammy's body. It's been two days and they've found neither. I was hoping normality would return, would burn away the nightmares that have haunted me since I've been back. But it hasn't. When I shut my eyes I see things, things I'd seen out of the corner of my eyes in those padded rooms. Unspeakable horrors that belong not in this world but in a place far beyond it. God save them. It's an empty platitude, but it's all I can offer. God save them. Fourth story. I used to receive singing lessons in the woods. When I was 11, I started taking singing lessons. I had wanted to for a long time, but my parents had never been able to afford them. Thankfully, I would end up receiving them for free when I met Mr. Vespers. My childhood home was located on the outskirts of a larger town where houses were few and far between, surrounded by intermittently dense woodland. We had a garden where I could often be found entertaining my younger siblings. I didn't have many friends at school, so I was basically always at home. I got on okay with my little brother and sister, so I often had to play the babysitter when my parents needed some time off. Ironically, they trusted me to take care of them over my older sister. I was doing just that when Mr. Vespers first happened upon me. The aforementioned younger siblings, Viola and Reed, were really giving me the runaround that day. Viola had somehow managed to climb atop our swing set and was refusing to come back down. She laughed and kicked her little legs, skillfully wrapped around the wooden bar from which the chains connecting to the swing seats hung. I didn't care to compliment her on it. All I could think of was how much trouble I'd get into if she fell down and got hurt. Soon enough, she realized that she was in a position of great power up there. Hey, sure. I'll come down if you do a handstand. She hollered. I did, clumsily, and while this seemed to please her, she still wouldn't climb off. Now do a cartwheel. I tried and failed. Reed who was sitting beside us on the blue roof of his little white playhouse, clapped nonetheless. Now sing. Loud, Viola ordered. Knowing there was no disobeying her, I filled my lungs with air and began. There's this one old song that she hated because it made her terribly sad, so I chose to sing that. I hoped it'd lead to her getting tired of her nonsense, but instead, she started crying right there on top of the structure. I was on the brink of despair and considering where to get a ladder from, when I suddenly heard the gate and the fence swing open and footsteps drawing closer. Upon turning around, I found a complete stranger approaching us. He was a bit taller than Dad and wore a pristine camel hair coat. His face was framed by sleek brown hair and a cropped beard. He looked like a pop star, but fancier. The unannounced entrance of a man I'd never seen before should have certainly given me a start, but something about him put me right at ease. Sure, he had ventured onto our property without even asking first, but how could I be alarmed when the look on his face was this gentle? Hey, sir, I said. If you're here to see my parents, they're not home. Yeah, I know. I was a pretty stupid kid. Oh, I don't know your parents, Toadlet. His voice was deep, rich and smooth, with all the resonance of a thunderclap. It was nearly enough to help me ignore the borderline insult he'd just thrown at me. Toad led. I bit the inside of my cheek. Do you need help with the noisy one? He stepped right up to the swing set, grabbed Viola and cautiously removed her from the bar before whirling her around once, causing a smile to reappear on her face. Then, he lowered her safely back to the ground. Thanks, sir, I said. Quite the climber, the stranger remarked. Not the only one in the family with talent, though, apparently. Toad let, I came because of the musical performance you gave earlier. I heard you when I was walking by. Your voice is heavenly. What? Nah. I paused. Really? I so swear, he said solemnly. Can I hear it again? 
After awkwardly clearing my throat, I meekly pressed out a few more lines of the same song as before. Viola promptly started to cry again. The stranger's smile grew, genuine warmth filling his eyes. It's wobbly, of course, and a tad brittle there at the end, but all in all, wonderfully harmonious. Sometimes, voices still change during a child's transition to adulthood. I hope yours won't. It's perfect. I seldomly received praise, so this made my heart skip a beat. I could teach you. My name's Brio Vespers, by the way. I'm sure. And we can't afford lessons, I told him honestly. It'd be free. How do you like the opera? Because that's my trade. My, you're disappointed now. I understand. I can't imagine a kid like you being fond of the more classical side of music. Not really. I've only ever seen them on TV, though. But maybe they're cooler in person, I offered. Mr. Vespers grinned. Or when you're the one singing them. Besides, I could teach you all sorts of other songs. That'd be kinda cool, I admitted, heat creeping into my cheeks. I didn't quite trust him, though. Despite the odd feeling of safety he somehow conveyed, I wasn't completely blind to how sketchy this was. You're gonna have to talk to my parents. What are they due to be back? An hour or two? I shrugged. I guess you can wait here. I'm in no hurry, Mr. Vesper said agreeably. You should sing, Reed piped up. You are a real singer. No? I want to hear. Operatic bass. Yes, the stranger confirmed steadily. Reed obviously had no clue what that was but he started clapping wildly nonetheless. I believe even Mr. Vespers found it charming, as he indeed began to sing. It was in another language, and even though I couldn't understand it, each word that left his lips shook me to my core. His voice seemed to vibrate and tremble. I imagined he could have made the ground shudder beneath our feet if he wanted to. Viola started crying harder. Reed was still clapping, only slowlier. Mr. Vespers finished with a little bow. Reed yelled for an encore while Viola ran to hide in the playhouse. Ignore her. That was awesome. I don't blame her, Toad let. I can be awfully frightening. There was a twinkle in his eyes I couldn't quite interpret. He wound up perching atop Reed's playhouse and partook in our playing, pretending to be a dragon, hissing and roaring at the squeaking children from up above. When my parents returned from their day out, they were more than a little confused. Still, it seemed that Mr. Vesper's uncannily soothing aura was working on them as well. What would those lessons look like? Dad asked as we were later sitting together in the living room. He was holding the business card Mr. Vesper's had handed him, not actually reading it. Would you teach her here at home? I absolutely could, if that works best for it. I meant could you take her somewhere else? Because I really don't want that noise around here, Dad interrupted him. Mr. Vespers frowned. No problem. And you're doing this for free? What are you getting from it? I'm a kind soul who appreciates talent, the singer replied without hesitation, a lion's grin curling his lips. Besides, if your daughter were to make a career off of her voice, that'd be beneficial to me as well. I guess it's fine, then. Gonna get her out of our hair for a bit. You're awfully kind, Mom agreed casting a sparkly-eyed gaze at an uneasily squirming Mr. Vespers. And you're really a professional? If you didn't think I was, wouldn't you have thrown me out by now? My parents exchanged puzzled glances. What do you mean? Never mind. From that day on, Mr. Vespers became a firm constant in my life. He'd pay us house calls every other day. Sometimes, he'd take me on field trips to the opera or the ballet, though any interest in these plays on my end was only ever feigned. It was kind of nice, though, sitting side by side with this odd fellow who despite his eccentric nature and brusque ways seemed to somehow care about me. He paid for my tickets, intermission snacks, and post-show meals of my choosing, trying so hard to excite me for the plot and the history of works such as Tosca, Die Walker, and La Traviata, to me, they were all either dreadfully boring or depressingly dark. It didn't help that the screens on which the surtitles were shown sometimes merely displayed the Windows error message. His biggest success on that front was to get me semi-excited over Die Zauberfloat. 
I told him the music was sorta catchy, and he was smiling over that all night. I think the cheerful fantasy plays are better, I explained to him across the dirty McDonald's table we were sitting at for our traditional dinner that night. I love fairy tales, so I appreciate a bit of magic. Plus, all of the others are just so sad. I want something, something. I fumbled for words. Life-affirming. Mr. Vespers offered, and I nodded eagerly. Well, he went on, that's an understandable preference. But all things considered, aren't you kind of drawn to dark themes? Sometimes. I guess I like creepy myths and horror stories. But no sad stuff. Toadlet, please close your mouth when you're chewing. I'm a patient man. I can wait for your answer till you've swallowed. He pulled a face. Anyways, it's good you're such a mirthful soul, but it's also quite surprising. I mean, your parents clearly don't care all that much about you. You're constantly being burdened with the responsibility of caring for your baby siblings. They're not babies. I contradicted him. And mom and dad care. They just don't show it sometimes. It's okay though. They have a lot of work on their hands cause of us. If you ask me, it's still their work, not yours. He fell silent, tilting his head at me. A forced smile curved his lips. Never mind. Eat your garbage. Sometimes, when we were walking side by side, I'd puff my chest, lift my head and pretend I belonged with him. I'd call him dad in my head. Sure, he was always a bit condescending. His nickname for me stuck, even though I'd told him a dozen times to drop it. His confidence in my skills, his patience with me. I felt more validated by that than by any decent grade at school. God, how I wished he were my family. I think he could tell. Of course, we weren't always out and about. When we actually practiced our singing, we did it in the woods, of all places. At first, this rather confused me, and I was hesitant to follow him each time he tried to lead me past the tree lane. Now, I know how this sounds, and no, nothing like that ever happened. Mr. Vespers never did anything to make me feel uncomfortable. He understood my concerns, and thus... We stayed around the forest's edge in the beginning. I didn't get why the woods were so important to him anyways. He attempted to explain it to me multiple times, but it was always so weird and cryptic. Something about the trees needing to hear us. I'd find out soon enough, though. The day I followed him into the woods for the first time would go down as one of the weirdest and most wonderful of my entire life. Can you feel how everything here responds to you? Mr. Vespers asked, voice husky with excitement. These are my woods. Never forget that. What do you mean? Your woods. He let out a soft chuckle. Then, he set his voice singing. A light ballad that lingered in the air with a soft reverence I hadn't thought his dark tones to be capable of. To my utter bewilderment, the branches of the trees around us started bending down, fanning out as if to try and get closer to him, to touch him. Flowers suddenly sprung from the ground where he stepped. The grass stretched to reach him, and vines slithered down their respective tree trunks in greeting. I was dumbstruck. I followed him until we reached a sunny little grove, where he discarded his coat and placed it on the ground for us to sit on. The soil would never stain my belongings, Mr. Vespers explained casually, like that was what I'd been wondering about. What is this place? Why, you've known it for a while haven't you? Your house isn't far from here. Yes, but... I couldn't find the right words. Mr. Vespers seemed rather pleased with my reaction. These are my woods, Toilet. I keep them alive, I make them grow. With your voice. He nodded, his eyes sparkling. So, what are you? This isn't exactly normal, is it? I asked, trailing my fingertips along the soft material of the coat. I was too nervous to meet his gaze. Our normal familiarity mixed with the primal fear of a soft, vulnerable child in the presence of a force beyond understanding. Every fiber of my being told me to run, but Mr. Vesper's fatherly gaze gently asked me to stay. It's not normal, no, he chuckled. And as for what I am, I'm human enough to walk and work among you. So that's all you really need to know. Are you afraid of me now, Toadlet? Yes. I admit it, but you know I'd never hurt you, 
right? This is still a lot. I understand. And I have to make another little confession. Where I'm from, we love artists. Especially aspiring ones, such as yourself. We want to bless you. We want to see you thrive. Look at me. Sure. Do you see now? I whipped my head up. It suddenly made sense. So much about him made sense now. His pacifying aura, his sharp tongue, his mesmerizing voice. I felt a thrill unlike any other. This was what my love for the unusual and the mythical had amounted to. You're a... Mr. Vespers interrupted me by quickly laying a finger over my lips. AFAI. Shush, he hissed, pressing his finger in a little harder. There was a mirthful smirk tugging on his face, though. Don't you say it? For some reason, I started giggling. A lot. This made Mr. Vespers laugh, too. Don't say it, you hear? Why not? I gritted out. It's so cool. Sure, you little freak, he snickered, finally removing his hand. So you're not afraid anymore, huh? No, I answered steadily. Still want me to teach you? Absolutely. So that's how we carried on. I soon learned not to prod my teacher with too many questions about his nature. We actually avoided the topic a lot of the time. It went unspoken, but never forgotten. He taught me to sing to flowers, to motivate bugs and birds to dance along, and to make vines and branches bend my way. Most of the time, we only practiced simple songs and ballads that didn't require too big a range. I just couldn't pull off the arias he tried to teach me. My favorites were the lullabies, though. I know, a little underwhelming, but they always came easy to me. To practice them, Mr. Vespers would fetch us a bunny, and I would have to sing it to sleep. That was quite difficult in the beginning. Mr. Vespers and I sometimes sang duets. My voice, being generally high in pitch, mingled beautifully with his booming, rich bass. Those were the good years. Mr. Vespers soon offered to call him Brio. I think by then he knew how important he'd become to me. He indulged me, in fact. He'd even comfort me whenever someone made fun of me at school. That happened quite often, seeing as I always stayed the ugly duckling. Yup, they say you grow out of it, but I didn't. I still look like a whole mess. Brio said it didn't matter. Sure, you have an angel's voice, you can't have one's looks too. That'd just be unfair. He'd always tell me in that winning way of his. That was all it took for me to cheer up. His was the only opinion that really mattered. As long as he was pleased with me, so was I. Life was good, and it remained that way until the day of the concert. When Brio asked me to sing in front of some of his friends, I was flattered. He'd sort of led on that the people listening wouldn't be normal. I assured him I'd be on my best behavior, and he said he knew. The concert was in the woods on a lovely afternoon in early fall. The leaves had already started turned brown, but the air was still pleasantly warm and rich with the scent of dewy grass and flowers. When Brio led me to the location of the concert that day, the audience had already arrived. Six people were lounging in the shade cast by the tall trees around us. They greeted Brio with hugs and handshakes and examined me with the same interest an entomologist might regard a newly discovered bug with. So you're the little lady we've been hearing so much, a remarkably tall and pale woman said as she gently took my hand in hers. What's your name, sweetheart? I was about to respond when Brio cut me off. You may call her Toadlet, like I do. She has no obligations towards you. You don't need to know her name. The woman smiled frostily. I have no ill intentions towards the child. I believe you, but I'm afraid I must insist, Brio replied with a strained grin. Bending down to whisper into my ear, he told me, I'm just being careful. No need to worry. I thought they were your friends. Why do you need to be careful? I asked in a low voice. The concept of friendship is flexible where I come from. Still, you don't have to be alarmed. Just sing and give it your all. We had prepared several pieces for this esteemed crowd, among them the ballad of Tamlin, Earl Koenig, which by the way was what Brio had sung the first time we'd met, though my rendition of it was hardly comparable, and Greensleeves. They were incredibly well received, 
But more than any of the applause, I appreciated how my teacher was beaming with pride. Well, he asked loudly, turning to face the audience with a smug grin. Is she all I talked her up to be, or what? She certainly is, one of the gentlemen replied, paying me a nod. She'd do nicely at court someday. Court? I inquired. Rio waved me off. That'll be her decision to make when she gets older. For now, I want you to omit mention of the court and of the king and queen. Let's cherish her art for what it is and not pressure her with future prospects, he commented pointedly. Despite this, I was already getting kind of excited. Court. King and queen. I had an inkling of what they were talking about. The tall woman, too, appeared to be impressed. Knowing she was about to give praise, I looked at her expectantly. Why, she's perfectly adorable. A trill like a bird's. How she can go from such a cheerful warble to these sorrowful tones she treated us to when presenting green sleeves is beyond me. You are a great teacher, dear Brio. Then again, I'll bet she's drawing from experience as well. Tell me, Toadlet, have you ever experienced heartbreak? Not melancholy, nor glumness, but true, genuine heartbreak. She leaned forward, a glint in her eyes. Rio frowned in confusion, eyes darting between her and myself. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to answer or not. The woman's stare made me nervous, though. I had to say something. I had to break this alien silence. No, ma'am. She smiled that same icy smile. It widened when she turned to face Brio. Well, I think your student is a wonderfully talented young lady. With a little more training, she'll surpass you in no time. I believe she is already. Her voice is so youthful and lively. I watched my mentor's reaction closely. I might not have paid a comment like this any mind at all. It was an odd comparison, but a compliment nonetheless. Rio's face, however, changed at these words. When he met my gaze, his eyes had hardened. The pride within them had been replaced by something else, something that frankly sent shivers down my spine. He didn't walk me home that evening like he usually did. He didn't come to pick me up the next day, or the day after that. As a matter of fact, I never saw Mr. Vespers again. I was sick for weeks afterwards. I could barely eat, and whatever meager contents my stomach did have left inside, I threw up. My belly simply hurt that much. I cried myself to sleep every night that followed, not just sobbing, but full-on wailing. But that stopped when my big sister came to bang on my door, yelling at me to shut the fuck up and that I was keeping the entire house awake. Nobody noticed when I started skipping school. The only class I ever showed up to was Mrs. Langtree's, my music teacher. She was the one who eventually caught on that something wasn't quite right with me. She sent me to the school counselor, who asked me whether all this acting up was a cry for attention. I said it was, but not for hers. I ended up dropping out. Mrs. Langtree, however, introduced me to her musical theater group. They took me on, and soon enough, acting and singing for them became my job. That was the one thing I was grateful for, the one thing that went right. When I wasn't on stage with them, I earned a living with gigs in live music bars and pubs. I moved out of my parents' place and into a shared apartment. Life wasn't always comfortable, but it was good enough. I never meant to leave the woods behind, though. I'd still take the bus to the outskirts of town nearly every weekend to wander the forest in search of my old mentor. I called out for him. I even sang for him, all by myself. The vines and branches still bent and stretched towards me, though. Sometimes, I heard his voice booming through the trees in the distance, but though I chased after it, I could never find its source. I refused to give up, though. He had to be there. He had to come see me eventually. Our connection couldn't possibly have been erased entirely by his pride, right? That notion changed one night when I was home alone. I had visited the forest earlier that same day and was now wallowing in my disappointment once again. I'd been fixing myself a snack in the kitchen when the sound of glass shattering had me whirl around. I was instantly on high alert grabbing both my phone from the counter and a large kitchen knife, just in case. The weather outside was frightful, 
so there was a possibility that a window had been somehow broken by the storm. I had a bad feeling about it, though. The noise had come from my own bedroom, I was sure of it. I drew closer to the door with bated breath, my legs moving much slower than I wanted them to. My knees felt like jelly. I was only being paranoid, I told myself. Pulse throbbing in my ears, I reached for the door handle. That same moment, the door flew open and a figure lunged at me, knocking me down. My head connected painfully with the hardwood floor and I let out a sharp scream. I found myself face to face with a young, watery-eyed man. Before I could make a sound, he'd wrapped his fingers around my throat, hesitantly starting to apply pressure. Panicking, I started thrashing around, frantically trying to stab him with my knife but failing to land a hit. Stop struggling. Please, the boy gritted out, struggling to keep his grip on my neck. Let go, I whimpered, horrified at feeling the strain of not being able to breathe in. I need air. I need. I'm sorry, he wailed. I have to do this. Please just stay still. Like hell I would. Gripped by wild, naked terror, I started kicking my legs, causing him to land on top of me. He made an attempt to get back up, but I ran my knee into that delicate soft spot between his legs. He cried out, and I managed to roll him off me. Fueled by pure adrenaline, I scrambled into a crouching position and placed one foot on his stomach, mercilessly pressing down. Who are you? What the hell do you think you're doing? I obrio vespers, he yelled out, grunting in pain. My face fell. You what? I asked breathlessly. I obrio vespers, he repeated, squirming beneath me. He made me come here. He said I had to get rid of you. He told you to kill me? I'm sorry, but I have a debt to pay. I don't care about your kind's debts, I said. How my voice came out so steady, I'll never know. I felt like someone had stabbed me in the gut with a maypole. Did Bria watch me when I came to his woods? Every time. I took a deep breath. My head was spinning, twisted by a ton of washed-up pain, grief, and, weirdly enough, frustration. Please don't kill me, the boy begged in a brittle voice. I swear I'm not a murderer. But I had to do what he said. He was forcing my hand. Is this something you can control? If I let you get up, will you come at me again? I asked sharply. No, mistress. He whined. You have my word, mistress. I let go of a deep sigh, staggering to my feet and reaching up to massage my throbbing temples. Why does he want me dead? I asked. You've been singing in his woods. The trees were listening. They still know you. Rio's getting on in years, though he tries not to show it. It's not just that he's jealous. He's scared of being replaced. He's scared that the trees want you now. And that warrants a death sentence. The boy looked at me like he didn't rightly know how to respond. Tell you what, I'll let you go, if you do me a favor. He leaned forward, eyes wide. Go back to Brio, I said. Tell him if he wants me dead, he'd better come and get his soft-ass hands dirty. Can you give him that message? Absolutely. Anything else? Tell him I don't want his goddamn wits. I would have never begun to compare myself to him. I was a kid, and I fucking loved him, and I would have done anything to do him proud. If he wants to go on like Snow White's evil stepmother, he can be my guest. But I'll burn down the whole lot of those trees if he chooses war. As for me, I won't go back there. So he best just leave me alone. The boy blinked. Uh, could you write that down for me? That's basically the note we said our goodbyes on. I sent him off with the letter for Mr. Vespers and haven't heard back since. I guess that's a good thing. It's been nearly three weeks since. I was about ready to forget the whole thing, lay the past to rest once and for all. But the band and I had a gig yesterday night at this huge open-air event. It's still pretty warm out right now where I live, and there were some other bigger names performing, so there was an enormous crowd. I could only see the people up front clearly. All the others melted into a mix of shapes and colors in the background. I was more focused on my singing anyways. I found that when I'm in front of a lot of people, they turn into a single entity in my eyes. I like this entity. I want to please it. 
but I don't take the time to concentrate on the individuals among it. And I didn't yesterday. Everything was fine and great, until we finished our last song and got ready to go off stage. I cast another glance at all these people, and that was when I noticed that one of them stood out. He looked like he didn't belong. He looked like he'd feel more at home in an opera house. Brio Vespers stood still as a stature between shouting, shoving, moving people. He met my gaze despite the distance between us. It was a mere moment. I was frozen. Our bassist, noticing something was off, hastily came over to me and pulled me along with her. If it hadn't been for her, I'd probably still be standing there, just staring. Before he disappeared out of view, I caught one last glimpse of my old teacher. He raised his hands to clap. Despite my better judgment, I went for a visit to the woods this morning. Fog was still hanging in the air, and the sun hadn't yet come out. I didn't venture in, merely staying by the forest's edge with pricked ears. I could hear him. His voice was booming through the thicket. I'd never realized how eerie it truly sounded. Fifth Story How I Survived and Kill Out a Wendigo My family was shocked when we heard our Uncle Benjamin was found dead in the woods surrounding his vacation home. I didn't know him very well, as he lived far away from most of the family. So, I only saw him at family meetings. His funeral wasn't a big event. There were my two aunts, Lucy and Lara, my other uncle Stephen, and my little nephew, Mikey. In Ben's will was written that I got his vacation home. I figured that it was nice to spend some time in a place where there was no distraction as I had to study for my exams. Also, if I would rent a small apartment, I would probably have to live off instant noodles and water for a few months. The day after the funeral, I packed up my things so that I could move to my new home. The drive itself was uneventful, though I did underestimate the length of the drive. When I was driving through the woods, I thought that I saw a face or two amongst the trees, but I just blamed it on my mind for being a bit sleepy, as it was around 11 p.m. when I arrived. Once I was there, I put all the food I had in the fridge and made my bed so I could sleep. When I woke up the next day I showered, made some breakfast, and hopped in front of the TV to watch a show on Netflix. Halfway through my show I thought I heard barking coming from the woods but didn't think anything of it as I thought it was coming from my show. However, the barking did not stop, so I decided to check it out. I walked a bit in the direction I thought it was coming from, but I couldn't find anything. So, I shrugged and walked back. The rest of the day was uneventful, I did however sort out a few moving boxes. As it was getting kind of late, I decided to watch one more episode of my show and head to bed afterwards. The next day started off normal. I showered, ate breakfast, and started to unpack a few boxes. However, around 10 a.m., I heard it again. Barking. This time, I knew it wasn't just my mind playing tricks on me, as I heard it loud and clear. I directly stopped unpacking and went to investigate the noise. When I went into the woods to check out the sound... I found a tiny Labrador pup. It was covered in mud and scratches. I knew I couldn't just leave him there, so I took him home. I gave him a bath to get all the mud and filth off him, and then I took him to the closest vet, which was about five miles away. Once we arrived, I took a seat in the waiting room. I couldn't help but notice that the other people in the room had a small look of judgment towards me. I totally understood why, as the pup looked like he had been attacked. When it was our turn, I heard a soft whimper coming from the pup, but he did decide to walk with me to the room. After a few checkups, the vet asked me if I owned the pup. I said no, and that I found him in the woods. The vet went quiet for a second and asked me if I wanted him to check for a chip. I said yes, and the vet checked, but found no chip. So, I suggested that if he didn't belong to anyone, I could take care of him. The vet sighed and went to get the papers for me to fill in, so I could take the pup home. On the way home, I went to the local pet store to buy some toys, food, and a food and water bowl. After buying all the stuff I would need to take care of him, I thought of a name for him. After about five minutes of thinking, I came up with the perfect name, Winston. I called out. Winston directly jumped up from his seat and started barking and wagging his tail. 
When we got home, I directly put everything in place. I put his dog bed next to the couch with some toys and his food and water bowl in front of the TV. After that long day, I was very tired, so I decided to watch a few episodes of my show. When I sat down, Winston started whining whilst wagging his tail. I asked, do you want to sit next to me? He answered the question with a happy growl and jumped on the couch beside me. I watched TV until it was around 10 p.m. and decided to go to bed. I decided to put Winston's bed in the bedroom next to me for the first night, so that he could get used to the house. When I woke up the next morning, I noticed that Winston's bed was empty and that the bedroom door was open. I thought that he had walked through the door to watch the birds through the giant window in the living room. However, when I went to check, I didn't see him. But then I noticed that the front door was wide open, even though I knew I locked it the previous night. My heart dropped. I panicked and ran out of the door to find him. After about 20 minutes of searching, I finally found him with a leaf he found in his mouth. I picked him up and carried him inside. It was near lunchtime, so I decided to put a frozen pizza in the microwave. I was very hungry as I hadn't eaten anything for breakfast. After eating, I took Winston for a walk, but he kept on looking into the tree line, as if something were there. Each time I thought he saw something, I looked, but couldn't see anything. After about 10 minutes of walking, I decided to head back to the house. I am glad I made that decision, because right after I closed the door behind us it started storming, the sky became a brown slash yellow color, and I could see the clouds rolling over. I'd seen this weather only once before. I was visiting a friend that moved to the Netherlands, then I first saw this type of weather. I decided to make some hot chocolate for myself and sat down on the couch to binge watch my show for a while. Winston was sleeping right next to me. After a while I fell asleep too, but I was awakened by Winston, whining by the front door. I decided to check up on him and noticed that he was shivering from fear. I looked through the window of the front door and saw nothing. I figured it was some deer walking by that had spooked the little pup. I picked Winston up and carried him to the couch, so I that could cuddle him to ease his nerves. The next morning, I woke up early and decided to do an early morning walk with Winston. After walking a bit, I saw a pack of deer just roaming around in an open area in the forest. This only reinforced my thought of Winston being scared from some deer just roaming around on our property. However, when we came back from our walk, I noticed something different about the front door. Scratch marks. Upon closer inspection, I saw that the scratches were massive. They were all about 10 inches long and 1 inch deep. Now I'm no expert in forest animals, but I dang well knew that those didn't belong to a deer. I decided to call a door repairman to fix it. They arrived about 30 minutes. Those are some massive marks on your door, but one of the men said. Yeah, I would get something for protection if I were you, the other one said. I followed his advice and later bought a small pistol to protect myself and Winston. After I got back from the gun store, the men were already done with the door. I gave them a thank you and they left. The following day started of normal. I woke up, had an early shower and decided to do another early walk with Winston. I saw two squirrels fighting over some pine cones, a flock of birds flying in the opposite direction of my house and I think I spotted a small mouse running through the freshly fallen leaves. However, Winston was shivering against my leg, whining. I asked what was wrong and he basically jumped. I decided then and there to head back. I heard something growl in the distance and another flock of birds flew in the opposite direction of the sound. When I was back on my property, I noticed something weird. My front door was ripped from its hinges and was lying about three meters to the left. I directly pulled my pistol out of my pocket because I didn't know if who or whatever had left yet. When I walked into the house, I froze. There were scratches everywhere. Whatever had done this had enormous claws. Upon closer inspection, I noticed that the claw marks were the exact same as the ones on the door from yesterday. I also noticed that my fridge door was hanging from its hinges. When I looked in the fridge, I saw that it was a mess. All the meat was gone, 
and all the drawers were ripped out of the fridge. I put the front door back in its place using the tools I had recently unpacked and fixed up the fridge. After I was done, I decided to take a little break, so I sat on the couch with my drink. After a while, I moved my arm only to touch something wet and squishy. I jumped and looked at what I had touched. It was the body of a squirrel, well, at least what was left of it. The squirrel was mangled in gruesome ways. A part of its skull was missing, its intestines were hanging out of its stomach, and its hind legs were broken. However, it didn't bleed anymore. I guess all the blood was soaked into the couch. I cleaned up the blood and buried the squirrel. I put a small stick on the grave as a sign of respect. After that I decided it was time to pack my things. When I was about halfway done with putting everything in boxes it was already late in the evening. I figured it wouldn't hurt to stay here one more night, but I was very wrong about that. I was woken up by Winston, he had jumped on the bed to hide with me. He was shivering and whining because he sensed that something was wrong. I stood up. Winston let out a bark to warn me. God, I should have listened. I went to the front door as Winston was looking right at it. I looked through the window and saw something big. It looked like a deer, but I knew it wasn't one. It had massive antlers and a skull-like face. And the smell, oh God, the smell. It smelled like a corpse that had been rotting out in the sun for days. When I heard another bark coming from Winston, the thing looked up and tried to smash the door with its head. I directly pulled out my pistol and fired two shots. The thing held in pain and ran away. After that thing ran away, I began to grab my stuff. I grabbed the most important things that I would need, picked up Winston and ran to my car. When I opened the car door, I heard the thing let out a cry behind me. I didn't look back. I hopped in my car and drove off. I'm glad that there wasn't much traffic on the road, as I was going about 90 miles an hour. I mean, can you really blame me for it? I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. While driving to get out of the woods, I saw the trees flash by. It reminded me of the first night I got here. However, it looked much different in the daytime. It also reminded me of the face I had seen amongst the trees. I now know it wasn't my mind playing tricks on me that night, as the face I had seen looked exactly like the face of that thing. Lost in thought, I wasn't paying much attention on the road. However, I was directly awakened by the sudden movement in the trees. When I looked towards the movement, I jumped in my seat. That thing suddenly jumped in front of my car. I screamed. The creature looked at me and lunged towards me. I slammed the gas pedal and drove around the creature. It stared right at me with its hollow eyes as I drove past. For hours later, I was back in my hometown. I figured I would go to my aunt and Uncle Lucy and Stephen. But then I remembered that Mikey was allergic to dogs. So, I went to my other Aunt Laura. I figured that she would like the company of me and Winston because of the sudden passing of her brother. I texted her. I was coming over, and then I was taking my new friend with me. She told me that it was nice for me to come over, but then she asked me why I would drive all that way just to see her. I told her that I would explain when I got there. After about 20 minutes of driving, I arrived at her place. She opened the door and looked at my face. What's wrong, sweetie? She asked me. I guess I was still looking a bit frightened after today's events. I asked if we could go inside. She agreed and we sat on the couch. Is that your new friend? She asked, looking at Winston. I told her yes, and that his name was Winston. That's a cute name, she said. Then she asked, why I was here, and why I looked so pale. I told her everything. I told her about Winston, about that monster, and about all the weird stuff that happened. She went silent for a bit. Then she asked me if I could describe the appearance of the thing. I told her about the antlers, the skull-like face, and the smell. After I told her about it, she looked terrified. She told me that my uncle called her multiple times about a giant creature roaming around on his property, and the next day he was found dead near his vacation home. She then told me that there were massive claw marks on his corpse and that he was hanging from his intestines, which were pulled out of his stomach. I was shocked. I asked if she had a laptop or computer I could use. She said yes, and that she would go and get it for me. 
She came back with her old laptop and gave it to me. I opened Google and searched for the creature. After about 10 minutes of searching, I found out what kind of creature it was. It was called a Wendigo. After reading some bit, I knew that the creature that had attacked me was a Wendigo. I told Lara and she was as pale as a ghost. We talked some more about all the events of the past week. But after about 20 minutes, Winston started whining. My aunt just chalked it up to Winston still being young, but I knew that wasn't the case. I told Laura that we needed to go, and she asked why. I told her that there was no time, but she insisted that she was going to stay. Then she looked at the window, looking back through the kitchen window was the Wendigo. She screamed. I tried to run after her, but she was too fast. She ran out of the front door, only to face the Wendigo. What happened next will haunt me for the rest of my life. The Wendigo opened its mouth and roared. Then it unhinged its jaw and bit her head clean off. Winston almost ran out of the door, but I picked him up just in time. The creature looked at me and grinned. I could still see pieces of my aunt on its teeth. I ran for the back door and out on the street. I didn't stop running until I could taste blood in my mouth. After checking if everything was safe, I collapsed underneath an oak tree. I was woken up in the morning by Winston. After remembering what had happened the previous day, I started crying. Winston curled up beside me to easy my nerves. I'm glad you're here with me, buddy, I said. After fully waking up, I figured that the best thing to do was to go back to my car and drive far away from here. However, when I was back at Aunt Lara's house, I saw that my car was turned into a wreck. The windows were smashed, the metal had been turned into shreds, and one of my car doors was hanging loose. I checked the back seat and saw that my bag was intact. I had left all my money in the bag, so it was nice that I still had it with me. After grabbing my bag, I headed towards the shopping mall to buy some food, as I had left all my food in the vacation house. While walking, I realized that the Wendigo had most likely followed me. I decided to head to the library to learn more about the beast, mostly on how to get rid of it. When I entered, the nice librarian greeted me. I asked if there were any books about the Wendigo. She told me that she would check, and I gave her a thank you. After a while, she told me that there were two books in the horror section and one in the mythology section. I thanked her and headed to the horror section to find them. After searching for about eight minutes, I found them. Once I was done, I headed to the mythology section to find the last book. Then I headed to the exit. The librarian asked me if I had a pass and I told her no, but that I had money. She scanned the books and I left. I decided to head to the grocery store afterwards, as I noticed it was lunchtime already. I bought a sandwich for myself and some treats for Winston. After eating, I decided to head to the local park to walk Winston. I walked about 10 minutes until I found a bench and decided to sit down and read the books I bought. When I opened the first book, I directly looked up on how I could kill the beast. When I couldn't find anything, I opened the second book. After looking, I didn't find anything either. I opened the last book that I had gotten from the mythology section. When I searched, I found information on how to kill the Wendigo. I directly went to the page and read that I needed silver bullets or a silver weapon. I remembered that there was a gun store about one mile away, so I decided to pack my things and head in that direction. When I entered the store, I asked if they had silver bullets. They told me they had and that they would go and look for me. Sometime later, they came back and put a small box on the counter in front of me. I knew that it was going to be pricey, but I had enough money to buy 10 bullets. I also bought a new gun as I figured that my pistol was too small to even fit the bullets. After I made my purchase, I walked out of the door and was greeted by Winston, who was wagging his tail happily. I told him that we were finally safe and that I was going to protect him no matter the cost. He let out a bark of joy and we walked off. After my little trip to the gun store, it was almost evening. I knew I had enough time to get ready for the fight with the Wendigo. I put three of my bullets in the gun and waited. After about six minutes of waiting, Winston started whining. I knew then and there that the beast was close. I stood up and turned off the safety of my gun. 
I heard the thing roar in the distance. I looked in the direction of the sound, and there it was, the Wendigo. I immediately fired two shots, and the beast howled out in pain, and it started charging towards me. I fired another shot, which gave me enough time to reload. I put another three bullets in the gun and fired all of them a second later. One of the bullets had hit its leg and another its eye. It collapsed and it cried out in pain. Winston started throwing a barking fit, which agitated the beast more, but it couldn't do anything as one of its legs was broken. I loaded another three bullets in the gun and fired the final three shots right into its heart. It fell unconscious, but I knew it wasn't dead as I had read that I needed to cut the heart out. I grabbed my survival knife and walked towards the hell spawn. I stabbed the rest of its legs and slit its throat. Then I began carving in its chest to get to the heart. After about 20 minutes of cutting, I had finally cut out the heart. I put the heart in my bag and headed back to Winston. Winston was hiding on the other side of the rock, where I had waited for the beast. Once he heard my voice call out, he started sprinting towards me. I kneeled and he started giving me kisses. I cleaned my hands in the nearby lake and we headed towards the nearest motel to sleep. When I woke up the next day, I showered, had breakfast, and headed to the nearest church so I could bury the heart. When I showed it to the nuns there, they escorted me to a burial place. I grabbed a shovel and started digging. After about five minutes of digging, I had created a big enough hole to bury the heart in. I put the heart in the hole and closed it. Then I went to the nearby field to pick two flowers. An oxide daisy for my uncle and a buttercup for my aunt, as it was her favorite flower. I walked back to the grave and placed down the flowers. I then went to my Aunt Lucy and my Uncle Stephen. I told them about everything. When I was done talking, they were speechless. I couldn't blame them, as I knew that the story would shock them. After they processed the story, they asked me if I was okay. I told them that I was still a bit shocked from everything that has happened. After we were done talking, they showed me the room I could stay in and then asked me if I could keep Winston away from Mikey as he was allergic. I told them that it would be no problem as Winston was very well behaved. After we had lunch together, I asked if they had a laptop I could use. Uncle Stephen went to get it for me as me and my aunt chatted for a bit. A minute later, Stephen came back with a laptop and handed it over to me. I then excused myself from the table and went to my room, where I began typing this story to get this message out to everyone. All I have to say is this. Listen to your instincts. It saved my life, and I believe it could also save many others as well. If you notice some strange things in the woods, get out of there as quick as you can. It's hunting you. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinion slash suggestions in the comments section. And like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.